again, what we're talking about is tests that are based on traits and you're measuring traits over time. You have no information about fitnesses. That'll be the, the last couple lectures. We're using traits. So a very popular approach is called QST versus FST. Is the within versus between population partitioning of the genetic variance of a trait, we call that QST, we'll talk about this in a second, is that different from the partitioning of random markers? So we have this metric we'll talk about called FST. It's a general measure of how populations diverge. We'll talk a lot about FST when we talk about test of selection based upon markers. This is different. This is using FST to give us one standard and then using a trait to give us another standard. So I'll first talk about what FST is, then talk about some of the limitations. So the idea is that this is a measurement of trait partition based upon markers. The idea about FST is an old idea by Luca Cavi Schwarza, a human geneticist out of Stanford. And his idea underpins a lot of tests for selection. And that is, if I have common demographic features working on a genome, population bottleneck, population structure, that signal should be seen uniformly over all neutral markers. So if I've got a structured population, so I've got deems, I've got individuals migrating back and forth, that population structure will give me expected neutral divergences between subpopulations based upon the strength of migration relative to affected population size and mutation. These are called island models. Sewell Wright did a lot of these, for example. And I can then use that value for neutral markers to capture the structure of that population based just upon migration and population sizes, and then contrast and see if that structure is different from when I look at a specific trait. So suppose I've got 100 traits. I have a set of populations. I use markers to get an FST value for that set of populations. Then I do this test on each of those 100 traits. So the traits here basically tell you which QST you're going to use. And for the same data and the same FST, I may have you know, a dozen, two dozen, million, uh, 100 tests on this. So the idea is departures from these two values may suggest the trait is under selection. And here's the idea. If QST is bigger than FST, it means I see more between versus within variation in my trait than I see in the random markers. And that's consistent with divergent selection. So spatial variation in trait values is in excess of the neutral expectations. If they're equal, eh. If it's less than, convergent. It means basically that my markers show more between population divergence than my trait does. That would be consistent with stabilizing selection over those deems, putting a constant value, and therefore making them diverge as little. So we talked about the last lecture, tests based entirely upon phenotypes. Now we're talking about somewhat marker-based tests where I'm using markers to give me a standard, what I expect the population structure to look like, and then using traits to ask about the genetic variance in those traits. So now we're not measuring phenotypes, we're measuring genetic variances. This is a big asterisk, because most QST tests don't actually measure genetic variances. They use phenotypic proxies to do that, we call those PST because they're piss poor. No, because it's phenotype, but they are, they are piss poor as well. So here's the outline. I'll get through FST, then we'll take our, our break. So I want to talk about quantifying allele frequency divergence among subpopulations. FST, a concept due to Sewell, right? Then I'll talk about QST, what I expect its distribution to look like, what can I say about its power. We'll talk about PST. This thing here is really interesting. And someone mentioned linkage to equilibrium. QFST, not QST, QFST. It turns out that uh, QST, even though it has problems, may have some really interesting features for detecting selection. We'll talk about it. So we'll spend a couple minutes on right, then we'll take our break here. So one measure for the amount of population structure is given by Wright's hierarchical FST statistic, also called fixation index. Essentially, it's the fraction of genetic variation due to between population differences in allele frequencies. 
And I can get FST values because drift and migration, local adaptation can shift it. So here's the idea. Let's look at the simplest case. I've got one locus with two alleles. If P denotes the frequency of allele over the entire population. So basically, this room is the entire population. I've got subpopulation one, subpopulation two. If I pull everyone together, the frequency of P is 0.4. What I then want to do then, so the overall variance is P1 minus P. Then I want to compute the variance of P over subpopulations. So what does that mean? I've got a value of P here, a value of P there. I compute a between population difference in P. So here's the idea. Here, for example, are four populations, some frequencies. The overall population is 0.4. If I use these then to compute a variance in the frequency, I get 0.65. So FST <coughs> turns out to be about, about a quarter. What that says is a quarter of all the genetic variation in that population is due to between species differences. Anybody know what FST is for humans? What fraction of all our variation is due to between group differences? It's under 3%. In some, you know, aboriginal populations and native populations, it's about 5%, but it's tiny. Here's a couple of cartoons. So basically, he, the big circle is treating the entire thing as one continuous population. Here are the two subpopulations. Basically, it says, population structure says, do I have to treat this as a set of nested populations or one big population do? Here, FST is zero because there's no between population differences in the two populations. Now you see I've got many more blue here, many more red there. And what you see here is even though it looks like a pretty big difference, FST is only about 40%. So only about 40% of the genetic uh, variation here is due to between population effects. And here is why it's called the fi fixation index. If they're fixed for different alleles, FST is one. So here's some fun examples. Here are rice populations. So Indica and Japonica are basically the, the, the two major variations of rice. Aush is an unusual variation down here. So look at Indica and, and Aush. About 25% of all the variation between a random line here and a random line there is due to between line differences. Look at Indica and Temperate Japonica about 43% down there. If you go to maize, stiff stock and non-stiff stock, those of you who know maize breeding, these are the two major heterotic groups in North America. FST is about 20%. This is what makes hybrid corn work, is that little difference there. If you do stiff stock versus tropical, subtropical, about 22% of all the variation is in there. So FST, I've shown breeding examples here, but FST is a widely used metric. How many of you have used FST? See, so it's, you know, People use it widely, and there's lots of subtleties in FST, but here's the basic idea. Okay, so that's a good place to take a break. So to frame where we are here, so in the lecture before this, we talked about using observed differences in phenotypes, either within a sample of populations, and then comparing that to, and then comparing that to an estimate of the affected population size the heritability, the time of divergence, asking whether a pattern is too great or too less a divergence relative to drift. We talked about comparisons within a time series. Now we're doing something where we're using marker data on one hand as our external comparison, computing the FST value for markers, a measure of kind of population structure. Then we're going to contrast that with the population structure for a specific trait. And to do this, we don't know the markers for that trait. We use the genetic variance for that trait, and that's called QST. Ken Spitzy introduced that term, but it was actually proposed by, by Tim Prout and Russ Landy and strongly hinted out by Rogers and Harpending. So the idea is I do a design, and this requires a mating design. It is not trivial. Most so-called QSTs don't do this. I basically then estimate the between population and within population genetic values, and again, their mating designs do that. And this ratio, if you basically uh, solve for QST, you get this ratio. 
if I've got inbreeding to level F, this is what the QST becomes. So what you basically do is you take your estimates for between and within, you plug that in, and you get a QST value for your trait. So the idea is you get an average FST value by looking at a number of markers. That's then your reference. Then in that set of populations, you do this experiment and look at a number of traits. And you simply ask for a given trait, is this QST value far greater, that is too much divergence, too much between population divergence, or far less, that is too little between population divergence than the FST value. These are often called QST, FST comparisons. They're very popular because people like FST. The problem is QST is almost never computed using a proper design. Usually people use phenotypes instead of resemblance between relatives on here, something we'll talk about. But the basic idea is your markers give you a certain partition of within versus between population structure. That's supposed to capture what a neutral trait would look like. Then you do the same analysis on your specific trait or traits, and you ask whether that pattern is significantly different from the pattern suggested by the markers. So the trait-based partition is called QST for quantitative FST. The marker-based partition is called FST. So Michael Whitlock has done, uh, UBC has done a lot of work on this. By the way, people who know Sally Otto, uh, Mike's her husband. Um, so uh, uh, one of the big issues was, okay, I've got two things I'm comparing. That doesn't mean anything without, without a formal statistical test. So how do I go from an average FST value, FST bar, to a QST value? We'll talk a lot about this on tomorrow. We talk about something called the lewinton krockauer test. It was one of the first tests for selection. It was simply based upon looking at FST values themselves and asking if a certain FST value was an outlier relative to one or not. But the bottom line from lewinton krockauer was if you take your observed QST value and you scale it by one over the average FST, and if I'm looking at N sub D deems, this scaling then takes QST and gives it a chi-square with number of deems minus one degrees of freedom. So the, it's called the lewinton krockauer distribution. And the idea was that you could somehow use FST to get some idea of what the distribution of QST should be. And if this distribution either was too close to the origin or too far away, that is too little or too big, is statistically significant. Now the problem is there's a huge amount of stuff involved in this. Number one, estimating FST bar, there's a lot of statistics in there. Number two, there's even more statistics in estimating this thing here. Um, chapter 12 goes into detail about a resampling method Mike proposed to, to get at this. But basically, here's the idea. This is a chi-square distribution and it's scaled by uh, multiplying by the number of means minus one, dividing by the mean FST, there's that distribution. So here are, and this is distribution that's set given your particular population with the mean QST, uh, the mean FST. Then you can look at two traits. For example, trait one, trait one falls out here, and it's not much of an outlier. But trait two, let's say it falls out here, that trait two looks like, if this distribution is correct, that it's significant. So one of the big issues is, how correct is this approach? The answer is, it's an approximation. There are better ways to do it, and the book talks about getting around that. But the idea basically is you use FST to generate a base distribution, then you compare your values with respect to that base distribution. Um, just a technical part in that um, FS, so this curve here, FST can't get above one it lies between 0 and 1, and you have to have a small FST value, otherwise that chi-square table, remember, that chi-square goes off to infinity. Any probability mass above 1 is not a true value. You want that mass to be really small, and that really only happens when FST is small. Basically just says it here. So for example, Whitlock recommends that uh, FST bar is no more than 10%. If it's 10%, then with two deems, uh, 0.2% of it lies above 1 with 5 deems, with 10 deems, basically none that lies above 1. 
So the point is, FST lies between zero and one. The chi-square is defined between zero and infinity. You want to you have this mean value here be small so that very little probability mass is above one, so it's a, it's a good approximation. Um, what you can basically do is this QSTN is the expected value from a resampling procedure that's discussed in the book that Mike developed to actually ask what it should be under neutrality, and QST hat is your observed value, and for example, this is the ever popular brown trout, and what they're doing here is looking at body length on here, and so this is the probability distribution for the observed value minus the value under neutrality. What you basically see is it's significantly different from zero. In this violin plot, the dot is the highest density region. Density is given by the width here. There's a 95% confidence interval. So this thing is highly significantly bigger than zero, and therefore its value of QST far exceeds the value you expect for FST. So does that suggest it's under selection? Well, because it's a little bit more problematic. It's not quite as clear cut as you might think. So let's look at one thing first of all, and that is power. So you can basically use this approximation for what the chi-square distribution looks like and look at QST and FST and ask how large this ratio have to be for example, to have power at the 5% level. What you can show using this here is that if I have two deems, that this ratio has to be five. QST has to be five times larger than FST for you to have any power. If I've got 10 deems, um, it's gotta be twice as large, so it's a bit more reasonable. So the more deems you look at, the smaller this ratio has to be. Likewise, I can ask, is it too small? Well, here, I basically, ha <coughs> <coughs> where's this? I basically have to have it about a third the value here for, for you to get that. So the bottom line is power increases with number of deems, and you need to have a really large value that is a really large deviation, either really big or one over really small to have any sort of power. So QST is very often underpowered. But here's one of the biggest problems. QST is formally looking at the ratio of the between group to within group genetic variances. Genetic variances. That's a lot of work. People often get within group genetic variances by parent offspring. But between groups requires you to have a series of parents offspring reared in a common environment. So because of that, people very often use phenotypic measurements. So basically, here is the phenotypic measurement between populations, and so PST is very often given as replacing the phenotypic difference between the means for the genetic difference. That phenotypic difference can arise because you don't raise them in a common environment. It could be environmental. Likewise, your estimate of within generation could also be biased by using phenotypes. So basically what you can do is you can ask how biased are these, and the bottom line is they turn out to often be pretty biased. So most of the estimates you see in the literature of so-called QST, quantitative genetic variation, are really PST. One or both components is not estimated in a mating design, but rather is estimated by looking at phenotypes. That causes all sorts of complications. You should always report such estimates as PST, not QST. So because the requirements of a common garden assay, true studies of QST versus FST were not common. In this review paper, roughly half the wild populations weren't based upon additive variation. They used these phenotypic proxies. So be aware that when you see a, PS, a QST paper, it very often may be a PST paper, and that makes it even less reliable. The bottom line, which is kind of the overview, is QST, FST is rather popular. As I'll mention at the very end, it's got some interesting features if you do it well, but very often it's not done well. So be hesitant on here. What do the empirical data look like? Right? So. Um, I'll give you the overview and then show you a picture. So there's been a number of reviews. So in a large review here by Marula's group, 70% um, had QST values in FST. 
Conversely, values of QST less than FST are rare. So you might suggest, wow, diversifying selection, different selection pressure to the DEMA is really, really widespread. Well, there's two problems. Number one, the variance of QST is much larger than the variance of FST, and that often leads to this condition. But the more important thing is ascertainment bias. You're a biologist. You're out there looking at your trait. You go, wow, that trait looks pretty divergent. Let me test it with QST, FST. You've already introduced a bias by not picking a random trait, but by ticking a trait, you say that looks unusual. Unless you correct for that sampling error, which no one does, it's a bias estimate. And Mike had a nice comment, says, it will always be possible to choose a set of traits that have higher than average QST values. Traits chosen this way cannot reliably be used to infer the extent of spatially heterogeneous selection. Examination of the traits chosen in many QST studies makes one wonder whether these traits were in fact always chosen with previous knowledge of the likely results. So ascertainment bias is a huge issue. One issue, by the way, where this is not a problem, expression level QST. Why? In expression level QST, you're looking at everything. There's no ascertainment bias built in. You've got a fixed number of things, you look at all of them. Traits, though, have a huge ascertainment bias with them. Here's that data, here's FST, here's QST, there's the line of equality. You see, again, the vast bulk of QST values being larger than FST. The vast majority, maybe all of it, is probably ascertainment. Um, so also, uh, there's an issue with polymorphic markers, basically. Markers with higher mutation rates underestimate FST. And a lot of the early experiments use microsatellites, which have high mutation rates. So those also are probably a case where FST is actually underestimated. But the key thing here is ascertainment bias inflates things here. And Whitlock again said, by those 2008 papers, very nice review. And again, you get references to the book. While useful, QFS, QST is a crude measure of genetic differentiation of a trait caused by local environments. So that sounds rather depressing. However, let me chalk talk. Whoop. Oh, never mind. Okay, it's just all sorts of random buttons here. Okay, let's do that. There we are. Let me chalk talk something for a little bit first here. And that is when I'm talking about the concept of linkage disequilibrium. In fact, actually, I've got a... Did I open up some other random... No. So here is our expression for the added variation. And this is for the effects at a given locus. If you notice here, these are for alleles at different loci. If you have correlations across alleles at different loci, that's called linkage disequilibrium, and that changes the added variance. In particular, I can write the added variance as the added variance equals a value in the absence of disequilibrium plus a disequilibrium contribution. This is often called the genic variance, and that's called the disequilibrium. And one thing you can show is whenever you have situations such that the trait variance is reduced after selection, so here's the entire population, I then pick the subset for the next generation. If that has reduced variation, that generates negative D. So negative D means that your added variation is less than value you expect in the absence of those correlations. So selection can generate negative disequilibrium values. And by the way, this is for unlinked loci. For unlinked loci, you can generate negative D. For linked loci, you get the same effect, only it persists even longer. So disequilibrium is a big issue. So that raises a really interesting point. Why are we using QST? The idea is FST shows me how normal neutral markers would be distributed in the population. In the back of your mind, what you're really thinking about is QFST, not QST, Q subscript FST. If I actually knew the markers that underlie the trait and use those markers, look at FST, would the FST for those markers be different 
then the FST, I'm measuring for neutral markers. That's really what people want to get at when they talk about QST, FST comparisons. The interesting fact is that for a lot of traits, we imagine those traits basically are under a large number of loci. If they're under a large number of loci, when they're under selection, each of those loci changes by a tiny amount. You get a very small signal at any individual loci. You add up over all loci, it gives you a rather dramatic effect. So one of the things you can see is you can have situations where QFST, divergence of the alleles underlying your trait, even though the trait is under selection, for example, in different deems, that divergence isn't much different than FST. So if QST is tracking QFST, that is QST is tracking change in the individual markers, you can have scenarios where there's lots of selection and you won't see that change. But the important point is QST is doing more than that. QST is tracking genetic variances. That involves both the allele frequency changes, but also disequilibrium. So we talked about QST, uh, FQST. So basically, um, so F, uh, uh, FSTQ basically, so uh, FSTQ is the value of the FST values if we knew the loci underlying our trait. And the idea would be that if our trait is under selection, that divergence at those loci is more than the divergence at random markers. You can, use the, you can often have selection where you can get lots of change, but little change at the underlying loci. If you have a lot of loci of small effect, which very often seems to be the case. So in that case, if QST was all due to FSTQ, that is the underlying changes, it wouldn't be much for power. The difference though is you also get markers. So you can have situations where the variation at the markers hasn't changed much from the overall variation, but QST is quite a bit different than FST. Why? Because selection introduces covariances and the covariances change it. So if you think about it, let's go back over here. This side okay for people? So if my added variation, suppose that equals 10 plus disequilibrium. With this equilibrium, the added variation might, for example, equal eight, because D is minus two. That's a substantial change. So QST is basically a function of these genetic variances. So disequilibrium can significantly modify QST. And in particular, here, this basically shows what the modification is. So there's the initial variation and the disequilibrium Stabilizing or selection, directional selection generates negative D. That gives me negative within generation values. You can likewise show that the D that you get basically uh, uh, across deems due to between, if this is the variance in the optimal values over deems, that's the D you get. That can be positive or negative depending upon the sign. So the bottom line is QST can be inflated by the presence of disequilibrium. So the underlying allele frequencies might not show a shift. The FST at the underlying loci for the trait of interest might not be different from the FST for random markers, or different enough to get a signal. But disequilibrium can make that signal much, much larger. So this is the expression here that relates QST versus the FST at the underlying QTLs. What you'll notice here is that these are only equal when the within and among LD are equal, which usually doesn't happen. With stabilizing selection, basically, you get QST is much larger than FST. So the presence of disequilibrium can actually result in QST giving you a better signal than you might expect. So let me, there's a bunch of pieces going on here. I haven't done a good job explaining. Let me, let me give you kind of what I think is the overview. So one of the reasons we're using QST is as a proxy. <coughs> and <coughs> it's as a proxy for the 
allele frequency structure at those alleles underlying our trait of interest. The idea is if I have differential selection over the deems, that those alleles will be structured differently, perhaps more divergence, than will random markers. We can call that allelic structure, if we knew the underlying loci, we can call that FSTQ, for the FST for the underlying loci. You can have lots of selection and have FSTQ be not very much different from FST, that is the divergence of those underlying loci may be a little bit away from, marker, from neutrals, but not much at all. So if QST was just based upon that, you wouldn't get much of a signal. But QST is not just based upon those underlying changes. These terms here involve disequilibrium, and so you can actually get scenarios where you get a stronger signal from disequilibrium in QST than you would in the individual markers. So if, for example, you knew the individual markers and just used those markers by themselves and computed an FST for those markers and contrast that with an overall, you might not get much of a signal. It wouldn't be significant. But if you actually computed QST using the variances, which incorporate not just the markers but the disequilibrium, you can get a dramatic signal. And a good example of that was this very interesting paper um, on growth cessation in European aspens. So what they did was they basically had, they had about 100 SNPs from 23 photoperiod genes and about 100 SNPs from 21 random control genes. So they had good reasons to suspect that there were photoperiod differences because of longitudinal gradient. They had then had SNPs involved in the genes of interest and SNPs at random. What they then found basically was the FST values for the protoperiod genes were about 2%, 0.18%. The FST values for the control genes were 1.6. This corresponds to FSTQ, if you imagine they've tagged all the genes. So what you see here is yes, there's a bit more divergence at those genes, but really not much relative to the control. However, they also looked for correlations among markers at these photoperiod genes. These were among unlinked sites. And what they observed was there was basically no correlations among random SNP markers, but there were strong correlations among the SNPs at these photoperiod genes across different genes. What are those strong correlations? Disequilibrium by selection generating non-random associations. So in this really interesting paper, the divergence at the underlying genes or proxies for them, didn't change much relative to divergence at neutral markers, but because of correlations, they got a pretty significant signal. So the summary kind of for FST, QST, is QST is trait specific. You have to give me the trait, then I can compute QST. QST is non-trivial to compute. I need to compute a between population variance that typically means raising things in a common environment, a common garden. Then I need to compute a within population variance, and the ratio of those two appropriately scaled is QST. It's often because this problem of growing in a common environment is often approximated by using PST. So people look at populations in nature and simply look at between mean differences in nature. That's a really bad design because environments can generate those. We call those PST, think of those as piss poor, they, they're not very useful at all. Ascertainment bias is a real problem because when people choose traits, they typically choose them with a bias. See, these traits are kind of divergent. Are they too divergent relative to FST? Well, since you picked them to be divergent in the first place, you've biased your sampling. So the fact that QST values are often larger than FST a lot of that is simply probably due to ascertainment issues. Again, one way to get around these is if you simply use expression level data as your trait. Then you pick 100 random genes. You're not beforehand picking traits which look unusual. With phenotypes, there's an unconscious bias. Oh, the leaf size are different, so let's measure those. With expression data, it's a random sampling from those. QST, how the genetic variance is partitioned, doesn't necessarily track QFST, which basically is 
how the FST values at the loci. So basically, if I knew the markers that underlied my trait and computed their FST, that wouldn't necessarily tell me what QST does. And this is good because basically, small allele frequency changes don't result in much changes in the FST value among loci underlying our trait, but linkage to equilibrium can introduce significant changes. So even though QST has this checkered past, if you believe the model that a lot of traits sort of follow the so-called infinitesimal model, a large number of genes, each a small effect, that's not going to leave much of a signal for FST for the genes underlying that trait, but it will leave a big signal for the genetic variances because it will generate disequilibrium, which will shrink the variances and give you a signal. So one of the things is, I think QST's got an overlooked, interesting feature, whereas where it's mainly used for, I think, is much more problematic. But you still see FST, QST a lot. It's very common. Yeah. Uh, what they were doing was basically they were using the markers and looking at correlations. So they had candidate genes, looking at FST in those candidate genes. It was slightly elevated, but not significant. Then looking at correlations among unlinked sites in those candidate genes, and then contrasting it with correlations among unlinked sites or markers, and show, showed there were correlations among the candidate genes. LD, well, so LD is a bad term because the correct term is gametic phase disequilibrium. LD is a bad term because people think you've got to have linkage. You can have significant LD for things which are unlinked. And these were unlinked. But it's a good point. It's, it's a bad terminology. But GPD is just too much of a mouthful. They didn't have to measure any phenotypes. Right. Yeah, so it's using, it's, but again, that, they were lucky because they, they thought they knew what the markers were. Because they were picking a very specific trait, photo period. It's fairly well known. Yeah, we'll actually talk about that in the next lecture. That's a good point where you can actually use this. It's basically called an enrichment technique. You've got a set of markers. You base the markers by some criteria, usually trait-based, and then ask, is there something different about those markers relative to a random sample of markers? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. No, no. Um, so I know that I'm not trying to like take the whole and like my specific project. Um, that's okay. But Okay, with cool. Individuals from individual colonies, so they're all related. They're all okay. well, sure. Multiple decision makers, these are. Um, and so we have gene expression data for them, and we have a phenotypic trait, which is their thermal tolerance. Okay, cool. Um, for each individual gene. Right. Is it, is it, would that be a QST, or is that a PST? So, what you want to do, be, because you have relatives in your sample, is you want to use mixed models to, because BLEP will allow you to, to take all those correlations into account and then extract those. And that's what you can do. But the bottom line is all comes down to, again, don't force a problem on your tool. Mm -hmm. Ask what your problem is and see what tool is appropriate for it. So if your problem basically is I've got a set of candidate genes involved in thermal regulation or maybe periodicity or something, do they show unusual features of the sample relative to other control genes? That's much more robust. So let's try another, yeah, uh-huh. Sure. Yeah, that, that's true, but it wouldn't contri contribute much to the variance because its frequency is so small. So yes, would high, have high, high LD, but its weight is really tiny. I mean, here's the here's the. Uh, a little cartoon as to why you generate negative D for different, different schemes here. So basically, assume the circle is the distribution of phenotypes before selection. So because it's a circle with no tilt, there's no correlations. These are uncorrelated. Then directional selection, I basically pick everything above a certain amount. If I then look at this slice, the points in that slice now are negatively correlated. 
Stabilizing selection, same thing, points that slice negatively correlated. Disruptive selection, select for really large or really small. Well, I get two negative slices, but between these, the, the colored slices together, I get positive D. So basically, whenever you reduce variation, you generate negative D, and in expand variation, get positive D, and basically with unlinked loci, that D declines by half each generation from recombination, but it's being countered by selection. And just to give you some idea about how important it could be, this is chapter 16, which is like a whole two lectures, three lectures by itself, but let's give you some numbers here. Look at all this fun stuff I'm skipping, man. That's so much fun. So here's a problem, and the problem is I have a character with a heritability of a half, and I'm selecting the upper 20%. So in that, you can then ask, here's the D value, and again, you, half it gets decayed by recombination, selection generates new D value. What you basically see is after about three generations, it reaches its equilibrium value. It goes from basically a data variance of 50 to a data variance of 38. Heritability goes from 0.5 down to 0.43. Those are for unlinked loci. So the effect of LD is pretty dramatic. And that's not super strong selection, 20%. So, and if I had linkage, what would happen is that instead of d dividing by a half, I'd have one minus R over two. Uh, I basically have R over two, and that would basically show the, the it fewer would be decay each generation, and the LD values would build up and be bigger. So when you have linkage, you generally, you create more LD because as you're building it up, you don't tear it down as quickly. Is a quick way to think about that. Again, that was an aside. I, I try to keep the asides a little bit down in this class, but you know, it's just so much fun stuff to cover. So um, I wanted to, to clarify a couple things. But is my mic on this morning, by the way? It's always hard to tell in here. Yes, no? Okay, um, I wanted to clarify uh, uh, something that was a bit uh, sloppy on my part. That's this distinction between QST, FST, and uh, FSTQ. I think it called it QFST. So one of the reasons we use QST is the idea that if a trait has been under selection, that if I have a, a general measure of how the population should be structured based on random markers, that's what FST gives me, assuming I pick markers which are effectively neutral, then QST should give me some insight into the genetic structure of those uh, markers underlying the trait. If I could measure those markers directly, we would call that FSTQ for the FST for the particular trait. So if I knew, for example, I had, uh, I had GWAS or I had uh, QTLs, I could then use those markers and look at the FST among those markers. That would be FSTQ. The point I wanted to make is that QST is actually slightly different from that. And the reason it's different is it's based upon variance components. And if you have linkage disequilibrium, and if you have selection, you will have linkage disequilibrium generate. Linkage disequilibrium makes the within population variance smaller and usually the between population variants bigger, and that kind of inflates the signal. So if the disequilibrium uh, among populations is bigger than disequilibrium within populations, and this is usually negative, so this is almost always true, then QST, that is measured by the variance components, is gonna be larger than FSTQ, that is, if I computed FST on the underlying loci. And the reason that's important is if you've got a lot of loci underlying a trait, each of which has small effect, you may not see much of a perturbation in the FST for those loci as compared to the FST for everyone else. However, you can still get a much larger QST than FSTQ because disequilibrium basically, this expression is satisfied when these things are equal, and usually that means they're zero, and if these things are unequal, so that the disequilibrium among is bigger than the disequilibrium within, which again almost always happens, then your QST is actually much larger than the FST you'd get if you actually observe the underlying loci. So I mentioned that QST has all sorts of problems. Typically people estimate it by um, uh, uh, using a, a phenotypes at some point, which makes it PST. For example, to do it properly, you have to grow the lines in a common garden. That's rarely done. People usually simply look at the uh, phenotypic variance among the means. That causes problems. 
There's also problems in power. But in spite of those issues, if you do QST properly, because this nice feature, this being a function of the variances, this being a function of allele frequencies, the variances here are perturbed by disequilibrium, and they can be perturbed by disequilibrium even when the allele frequency changes are actually quite small. So it's a subtle feature, but I think an, uh, uh, an, an unrecognized important feature of QST. So that's a bit, that's a bit subtle. On real, several people commented didn't, didn't quite get that, and it, it, it is a subtle point. Um, and the, the bottom line basically is this is measuring variances, and this is FST based upon allele frequency changes. This is allele frequency changes at those underlying loci for the trait. We almost never can get a hold of this. If we could get a hold of this, QST is actually still more powerful because what it does is, in addition to looking at allele frequency changes, it looks at correlations among alleles of different loci. That's what disequilibrium is. And those correlations can often leave more of a signal than a departure of the FST for the loci underlying the trait from the FST you expect for neutral markers. Okay. Yeah, question. Would, would SNPs in your markers be FST? Yeah, so for example, so let's imagine you did a GWAS. And all those GWAS hits then, those would be your FSTQ. It wouldn't be everything in the FSTQ because GWAS, but that, that's how people use it. So the example I gave uh, about looking at photoperiod genes um, was an attempt to get at this. So let's go to the next slide here. Oh, can I talk about the, 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 the key part is, you, it's not that you can't, the gene expression might give you markers, but you couldn't use the gene expression data directly. You can't use the count data directly, because that's the QST. But if you use that's the right. SNPs, if you use the SNPs, okay. the SNPs associated with those, yeah. So, and the example I gave from here, and again, you can look at 12.7 in the book, was basically they looked at Aspen, and they looked at photoperiod genes. And they were basically looking at a latitudinal gradient, so you expect photoperiod to be important. And they had about 100 SNPs in the photoperiod genes, and about 100 control SNPs. And what they showed was that the FST among the photoperiod genes, we'll call that FSTQ, because we think the trait we're looking at is photoperiod related, that had a very slightly elevated FST relative to random markers, but not significant. However, if you look among the photoperiod SNPs at different loci, they actually showed correlations, which weren't seen among the uh, other random SNPs here. Those correlations are basically showing you have LD that's being generated by selection. So the point here is that if you just used uh, FST for the underlying loci for the trait, you wouldn't get as much as signal as, as if you used the variances for that trait. Because the variance include both changes in FST and also changes in correlation, that is linkage to equilibrium introduced by selection. And I want to stress when I say linkage to equilibrium, you can generate lots of LD among unlinked loci. The reason people use LD is much easier to say than gametic phase to equilibrium, which is the more proper term, which doesn't in invoke an idea about linkage. But you can generate lots of correlations even among unlinked loci. The issue is they get removed very quickly, so you have to have selection continue to generate them. But you can generate substantial LD between unlinked loci with selection. So I just wanted to clear up that point. Maybe it made it more fuzzy. But again, th the key in this course is I want to introduce you to some concepts. If you're actually going to use this, you'd probably go in and reread the notes, read the example, read the section in the book on it.